let's uh, finish up in this video the final budgets that we have to look at. Here's the ending finished goods inventory budget and a logical question is well why did we wait till now to do it? Why do all the other budgets first? We knew what our ending inventory would be, 3,000 units. Why didn't we just do it? It's because we need a cost per unit. How much did it cost us to make one unit of inventory? So to do that, we first had to do our direct materials budget. We note that it takes one unit of input to make one unit of output. We noted that it was $4 per meter per raw material. So every finished good has $4 of raw material in it. We had to do our direct labor budget first to determine how many hours are required for each unit, the cost per hour, and that results in $10 per in direct labor per unit that we produced. We also had to do the manufacturing overhead budget to determine what our predetermined overhead rate was to multiply by the hours that are incurred to get $6 in manufacturing overhead per unit. So we had to do all of these, the direct materials, the direct labor and manufacturing overhead budget to get us to $20 per unit. So now we can take our ending finished goods inventory from Schedule 2, 3,000 units, our unit product cost that we calculated from the direct materials budget, the direct labor budget, and the manufacturing overhead budget to get the total that will be in finished goods in dollars. Now why do we need that dollar amount? because we have to do a budgeted balance sheet for the end of the year so it's not enough just to have the units we have to have the cost well here's the selling and administrative expense budget this is all the expenses that are not included in production so we start uh, notice that uh, it starts with a variable component and a fixed component so let's begin with the variable component our variable selling and administrative expense per frame, notice the asterisk down here, we have an assumption. There are commissions, there's clerical and shipping involved. And that is driven by units. Sometimes our variable and selling expense will be driven by something else, but in this case it's driven by units of sales that we get from Schedule 1. So here's the budgeted sales in units for the four quarters. <clears throat> here's our variable selling and admin expense per frame, $2 per frame. So there's our budgeted variable expense for the four quarters, followed by a long list of budgeted fixed selling and administrative expenses. So we have advertising. We can see that we're going to spend $20,000 per quarter. Senior management salaries are constant at $50,000 per quarter. Why? Well, they're fixed. Insurance, constant per quarter. Again, property tax and depreciation. And that'll give us total budgeted fixed selling and administrative expenses. We add it to, uh, to uh, our variable expense along with our fixed. We get our total for the year. And then we have this complicated section down here. And it can be complicated, so let's walk through it slowly and see what we have. Since this is our total expense, remember, like we did in the manufacturing overhead budget, we we subtract depreciation because while we will incur 142,000 in accrual expenses, we don't incur, incur 142,000 in cash expenses. Depreciation is non-cash, so we add that back each time, or sorry, we subtract that from our total expense. But look what's going on here. <clears throat> we have insurance expense. We're taking the insurance expense off in each quarter. Up here, you can see we charge $19,000 per quarter. Now we're taking it off because we pay for the insurance all in quarter three. So the first thing we want to do is we want to reverse the charge for insurance expense and then put it back in the quarter where we actually pay for it. We can see the same thing with property tax here. We're taking property tax off the total and then recharging it in the quarter that's paid. So by looking at this, we can tell that we pay our insurance premiums in the third quarter for the entire year and that we pay our property tax in the fourth quarter for the entire year. Once we make these adjustments, we have our cash disbursements for selling and administrative expense. These are line items in our cash budget when we get to that. Here is our cash budget, and we can only do it after we've done all the other schedules. 
So it basically is done a little bit differently than all the other budgets. In all the other budgets, we can sort of go across the quarters for each line item. Here, we cannot do that. We must work our way down one quarter because our ending balance becomes our beginning balance for the next quarter. So to do a cash budget, we work down the quarter, back to the top, down the quarter, back to the top, etc. So let's work our way down one and see what we get. There are four major sections to the cash budget. Section number one, where do we get our cash from? Cash receipts. So we start with our beginning balance of cash, 50,000. We get that from the balance sheet. Add collection from sales. We get that from the sales budget. There's number one showing schedule one. So total cash available is 590,000. There, there is part one done. Now, you cannot work your way across. You can't work your way across. Some of these you can. Collection from sales, once we have that schedule one, we can fill in these numbers across, but we don't have our beginning cash balance, so we can't sum them. Then we go to our disbursements. Well, we're going to pay money for direct materials. That's from schedule three. We're going to pay money for direct labor. That's from schedule four. We're going to pay money for manufacturing overhead, right from schedule five. We have our selling and administrative expense. That's right from schedule seven. And our income taxes we get from Schedule 9. Schedule 9 is our income statement. So we haven't done that yet, but we have a line item for that. We have a sort of a budgeted amount. Equipment purchases. These are notes that, uh, that, that we'll, uh, we'll read when we read the questions or uh, in the real world. The, these will be from our capital budget. Management decides that it wants to spend $20,000 in equipment purchasing per quarter and it's approving ten thousand dollars in dividends per quarter that's a cash outlay so the first part is what cash is coming in the second part is what cash is going out and we total it there's our total disbursements. so section one total cash available section two total disbursements section three is either we have more cash than what we need or we're running short so excess or deficiency of cash here is a deficiency of cash so in the first quarter, we know we're going to run short of cash. We know that. That's the beauty of budgeting. We get to see that before we run short of cash. So the fourth section is our financing. This is a little bit tricky to do, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a des there's some desired ending inventory, or sorry, desired ending balance of cash that's that 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 a company would want. In this case, they desire to end a quarter with at least $50,000 in cash. So once we have our uh, shortfall, we can go right to the last line for ending balance and put what our desired ending balance will be is 50000 So we need to borrow this shortfall plus some interest expense. Now this is the tricky part. There is assumption in cash budgets that, go, that goes like this. We borrow money at the beginning of the quarter and we pay interest at the end of the quarter. So any borrowing that we do will occur right at the beginning of the quarter and at the end of the quarter we will have to pay interest on that but the borrowing plus the interest still must equal the 50. So we can't just take the 50,000, take the shortfall and borrow the rest because we'll have borrowed more than what we need. So there's a, there is a formula and a way to calculate this, and it starts like this. We need this much money. So we need negative 229 plus some amount X, plus some percentage of X for interest. So in this case, interest is 4% for the year, which is 1% per quarter. So we would need some amount X plus some amount, some percentage of X, to equal 50,000 and then we solve for X. Whatever we get, uh, and I know that sounds complicated and I, I gotta tell you, trying to teach this stuff by just reading chapters is very difficult. You really have to do the problems to understand how this is, how this is done. But here's our cash ending balance which becomes our beginning balance for the next quarter and we do the same thing. Each line item comes from a, a different budget. So to sort of help you with this a little bit more, let's look at uh, 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 how, how the chapter would solve it. So here we are. This is sort of the formula we'd we would use. Our excess cash or our deficiency plus what we need to borrow 
minus the interest on the borrowing has to equal our target balance. Our target balance is 50,000. We ended up short by 229,000. So we're gonna borrow some money, but from that money we borrow, we've gotta take off some interest. So by the time we solve for X, we get 281,998. And again, you really have to do problems to understand this a little bit better. Well, we've only got two more statements to get through, Schedule 9, Schedule 10, the budgeted income statement and the budgeted balance sheet, with the budgeted balance sheet being not so important. But this one is the budgeted income statement. And we can see that it sort of builds itself from all of the other schedules. Sales we get from Schedule 1, our cost of goods sold, 200,000 frames at $20 per unit, we get from Schedule 6. Uh, our gross margin is just simply a subtraction, right? Selling and administrative expenses, we got that from our selling and administrative uh, budget. It gives us an operating income. Now this is where it gets a little bit funky. Uh, we're doing income taxes first, then we're taking interest expense off to get to net income. Typically what we'd do is we'd look at operating income as earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT. Then we'd take off interest to get to taxable income, then we take tax off. But to do the cash budget, we have to have some allocation for taxes payable. Once we know that, then we can determine whether or not we have a cash deficiency or a cash surplus. If we have a cash deficiency, then we borrow and then incur interest charges. So because of the way we fill out the cash budget, eh, we kind of have to make a little bit of a, a mild correction here in the budgeted income statement. But the only difference will be the after-tax cost of the interest expense, which is probably minimal in most cases. Uh, the more sophisticated the company is, the more sophisticated their system is, it will make this adjustment first. It will have the interest expense first, then it will take care of taxes. But for our example, it would be a lot of back and forth, back and forth before we got the answer. Computerized system, that does it automatically, right? Just be aware of that. Here is the budgeted balance sheet, and it looks really messy. It looks really big and long, but understand that everything builds from another statement. Our cash, uh, ending cash, we get from our cash budget. Our accounts receivable, we already figured that out. Our raw materials inventory, finished goods inventory, remember in the previous budgets, we already had our ending balances for that, which gives us our total current assets. For plant and equipment, our land, well, it stays the same. We have to keep it at historical cost. Buildings, furniture, and equipment, again, is at book value, but we bought, remember, we spent $8, $20,000 a quarter, $80,000, so we simply add that number. Whatever our depreciation is that we took this year, we add it to the existing depreciation from last year. That gives us total assets, uh, uh, sorry, total uh, long-lived assets and total assets altogether. Going down into liabilities and shareholders' equity, our accounts payable, we already got that from one of our schedules. And here's where it's a little bit uh, where we have to do some calculation. Our common shares stay the same, unless, of course, we issued more, but typically they stay the same. Retained earnings. How we arrive at that is we take last year's retained earnings, we add any net income that we get, and then we subtract from that any dividends that were paid. And recall, we took $10,000 in dividends per quarter, so we take $40,000 off. And that will hopefully give us a balanced, uh, a balanced balance sheet. Now, the balance sheet, honestly, isn't that critical because most of the, uh, most of the decisions uh, of whether we came in over budget or under budget have already happened. So there's not a lot of responsibility for the balance sheet because those responsible for overages and underages would have been caught before the number hit the balance sheet. This is just a result. This is just the end number. It's not part of the process in getting there. It's just a reported number, a snapshot in time. So it's not that important. But the important thing here is that every line item comes from somewhere else. Uh, so as you go through the budgeting process, I want you to get through the cash budget and the income statement uh, uh, budget, uh, the budget income statement, this basically builds itself. So there's not a lot of extra work that has to be done to take it to, to that final step. 
That takes care of our master budget. That takes care of all of our 10 schedules. Again, I'll see you in the exercises because that's where the real learning uh, uh, happens. Thank you.